Okay, thank you for attending. My name is Gabriel Rudo. I'm the project coordinator for Empower Idaho, formerly Office of Consumer and Family Affairs. We're here to talk today about um, changing the language in our field uh, using more recovery-oriented language. Uh, we're here with Hannah Rose, who has about 30 years working with individuals with um, trauma, substance abuse, and mental health concerns. Um, she is the sole proprietor of um, what's it, what's it called? Impact Coaching and Consulting <laughs> based in Vermont, and she is the Technical Assistance Manager for the Behavioral Department, Behavioral Health Department for Alterum Institute. Um, thank you, Hannah, for, for uh, presenting today. Um, I'll pass it on to you. Well, thanks, Gab, Gabe, and welcome, everyone. I really hope I know that sometimes webinars are when presenters are talking sort of at you and there's not any room for interaction and I would like to do this differently and would love if you all would um, offer opinions, ideas, um, thoughts in the chat box. It's, it's really about us doing this together. And I also wanted to say that any suggestions or ideas of different language are, are not necessarily what um, I'm expecting people to use. It's more around thinking about how we are talking about substance use disorder and why and how it can affect people either positively or it can increase stigma. So that's the purpose of this webinar is to just start digging a little bit deeper on the impact of language. So please, please, please don't be shy about typing in any thoughts that come across your mind or ideas as we go through because I'd like to hear from you. I always learn more from people on these webinars than um, I'm probably giving to you. So I really appreciate you being here. Uh, it's beautiful here in Vermont. I hope it's nice where you're at. And thanks for giving up your lunch time. So we're going to get started. Just a, a, just a quick overview. We're just going to talk about the power of language in general, not just within um, this this field and this this world and also talk about some other models that have made some significant replacement changes um, in order to put the person first um, versus a condition they may have. We'll talk a little bit about how addiction language sort of headed down the negative path and why and then I'll introduce you to uh, Dr. John Kelly who's done really amazing work and give you some resources if you want to explore the subject further. A lot of the material today is from Harvard University and the work that he's done. We'll talk about some stigma alerts so uh, language might not necessarily actually increase stigma but there's always it's looking at things that could potentially um, increased stigma and then we're going to practice some recovery language and that's where I'd really like to hear your ideas and then just a few additional considerations. The action plan is really asking you what did you get out of this webinar and what, what are some things that you might do to move this language um, forward. So for some reason my slideshow is not advancing. Here we go. So in chat, if you wouldn't mind, just quickly tell me um, who you are and what you do, just so I have an idea of who the audience is since I cannot see you. I know you can see me, and I'm not sure who's attending. If you wouldn't mind just putting in chat real quick who, um, who you are and, and what your role is, why, why you decided to come on the webinar today. And I also want to check, make sure everybody has that chat availability. So I've heard from Gabe, Rebecca, I know that you were using the chat earlier. What is your role or, or, or hopes or reason for coming on this webinar today? Certified peer support specialist, excellent. Well, I'll, as I wait for others to um, enter their role, I'm going to just move forward. So 
So just my first opening question for you is this quote that we probably all heard um, early on in elementary school, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. So what I'd like to know is what are your thoughts about this quote? Um, think back to a time when someone said something to you that affected you deeply um, either in a positive or negative way, what feelings were evoked? So what are your thoughts about sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? And welcome, Amanda. Thank you for another certified peer specialist. Really appreciate the work that you do. So what are your thoughts, any of you, on that quote? Welcome, Robert. Gabe, um, words can definitely hurt. Any other thoughts about that quote? It's not true. Words can be so hurtful and stay with you longer than bruises and broken bones. So I guess I'm talking to the right audience um, because I think we were told that quote and, and that, that, that's been going on for ages and ages. And uh, the idea that words can't hurt, um, I, I agree that some can um, cut in so deep and stay with you for a long time. And I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where someone has said something to you, and if you reflect back, you can remember where, who, even what your surroundings were and what you were wearing, because they can be so powerful. So language is powerful. It elicits deep feelings, whether it's positive, negative, um, it can bring up deep feelings, as you all just mentioned. Um, words also carry action. So if somebody says something to you, maybe they say, you know, I believe in you and you can do this. You're going to be able to do public speaking. That can help you move forward if somebody's believing in you because they use those words. Also, if somebody says something negative, like you'll never follow through, it might motivate you to follow through just to prove them wrong. Words also define the nature of relationships. So either our language, terms we use, the way we talk to others will raise a relationship up, keep it neutral, or tear it apart. Um, the thing I want to focus on today is language, terms, phrases, words also calls up a host of Im imagery. So um, even though we all really care about folks um, with substance use disorder and we understand uh, because I can tell by the work that you're doing that you do and you deeply care. Um, when I say drug addict, if you wouldn't mind putting in chat, what are some um, images that may come up? So if I say the word, there's drug addicts down the street, what are some images that the media may portray or you've heard people say or even might come up in your minds? And again, I'd love to hear from you in chat. Here we go. Oh, Robert, crime. Yes, yeah, so they're they're all criminals, right? <laughs> what else? Homelessness. Possibly dangerous. Amanda, in my mind, it's people hurting. That's why you're probably really good at the work you do. But our general public disease, absolutely. Um, often people will say dirty, you know, unkempt. And, and so that all those things, all the language you use, like drug addict, can call up a host of imagery that might not be helpful to the people that we are trying to work with. So um, language is ever evolving and often without any intention, we can use words that marginalize and lower the status of the population served. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And a lots of times it's without any intention to do so. So stigma, so this is what this is about today, language, and how can we decrease stigma through language? So we can probably never get rid of stigma, but there are ways that we together as a national movement can to begin to decrease uh, stigma around substance use disorder 
um, as much as we possibly can. So it's an attribute behavior condition that's socially discrediting, right? Um, um, it's when people label people um, and and label them so that somehow they're less than. Um, they don't deserve the equal amount of dignity and respect as the population labeling them. Um, the, this very stigma really can hold people uh, that really are looking for help. They're looking for whether it's treatment or peer recovery or other passive recovery. Um, it can really hold them back from seeking, seeking some help. So just to go to another uh, sort of world, what are some examples of words that we have used in the past, not now, to describe somebody with a mental illness? Can you think of some, maybe some old, uh, less than positive words that people used in the past? Crazy. Absolutely. Keep them coming. Let me hear some more. That's an excellent point, Robert. How about mental health professional downgrading recognizes professionals in the addiction field? Absolutely. Psycho. Perfect, Amanda. What else? What else do we did we call people that were that had um, some different conditions and maybe we were familiar with? <laughs> Freaks. Absolutely. How about a few more? And thinking about words like crazy, psycho, freaks, um, calling them by their illness, absolutely. They're, they're psychotic, uh, they're schizophrenic, they're depressed, they're dangerous. Um, how is that possibly going to help them feel part of this world, an equal part of this world? Just the language itself would be enough um, to, to hurt them and not harm them. So you all nailed it, crazy or crazed, nuts, lunatic deranged, psycho, the list goes on and on. Monsters, wow, Amanda, yes. Um, so, uh, and there's also phrases that go along with uh, substance use disorder or different mental health conditions, like they're afflicted with, they're crippled with, they're, they suffer from, they're a victim of, they're stricken with. All those phrases sensationalize um, what somebody um, is dealing with. It, it, and again, even Here's, here's an area people might not think that that could enhance stigma, but um, if somebody is crippled with depression, um, it, it takes away any sort of normalization that people, you know, do um, have depression. And so we have to really be careful about the words we use before the words. So um, I think, and I, I, I ask if you agree that there have come a long way when we're talking about mental health conditions um, that the mental health field really and and peer movement uh, really took a stand in using person first language so language that puts a person before a diagnosis or label um, and language that does not define a person by a condition and I know I know that I am preaching to the choir um, I'm just kind of building up to some points um, so uh, they've moved it to a person with schizophrenia. So the person, there's a, they're a person first. They're a mom, a dad, a brother, a sister, a friend, a pet owner, a farmer, um, and they have schizophrenia. Same thing with a person who has depression. So my question is, um, well, hold on. There's, there's also some additional marginalizing language that they're trying to replace, um, like refused, declined. Um, um, can come come across as they're refusing help and and they're defiant people when they have repeatedly said no resistance you know non-compliance no they're choosing not to they might be seeking alternative methods meeting their needs they're not in agreement with the treatment plan that's presented um, in front of them so really we have to think more about phrases, words, and um, the whole way we're talking about people. So why are we still referring to individuals with substance use disorder as drug addicts and alcoholics? I do want to do a side note here. I understand within a 12-step model, those words are actually positive within the rooms when somebody um, declares 
or admits or comes forth and says that they are a drug addict or an alcoholic within a 12-step program and 12-step rooms, they are embraced. Um, it's part of that process and program. Unfortunately, outside of those rooms, these words are doing incredible damage and harm and just continuing the stigma across our nation. So what are your feelings on that? Any thoughts so far? That's a very good point, Rebecca. Um, people are stuck in their ways and don't want to change their wording. And that is why I am so glad that you are all on this webinar because it does take some trailblazing um, in order to start helping people change language. But as they did um, in the mental health world, it can be done. It just takes some time to start using new words. Any other thoughts? I really appreciate your engagement today. So what are some reasons for changing the language? We, we want to help individuals regain self-esteem. Um, we want to treat individuals with dignity and respect. Um, people that are, are um, in act, active substance use disorder still deserve dignity and respect. They're, they're human beings on the planet. Um, it may help more people come and ask for help. Um, if we are moving away from these shame and blame words, more people may come forward and ask for help. And I think that's where the peer service world has really helped. It also allows lawmakers to appropriate more funding. Um, and it's really helping the general public to have a shift in thinking that this is a medical condition as real as any other. And you're right, Rebecca, I, the media has not helped in trailblazing with changing words, and that is a place that we can be trailblazers by contacting the media and, and talking to them about this. So brief history of why things got so derogatory um, was during our era of our war on drugs, as we all know, didn't work so well. Um, and it was, these terms were championed to help their thought process was, and I think it was a good intention, was a big effort to, to, to dissuade people from misusing substances. But as we all know, um, the scare tactic <laughs> with horrible pictures and derogatory terms, uh, in fact, probably did the opposite. Um, and really education about uh, what happens to the brain and the body with different substances uh, we didn't know as much as we do now due to um, being able to do PET scans and measurements of the brain. Our technology has really moved forward and, you know, in the last decade or a little bit more, we have a lot more understanding about uh, why people continue to use substances. Um, it's, it's not a choice after so much time. Um, so, Language should be changed to reflect, today, reflect today's understanding of the science of substance use disorder and the impact on the brain. So if we want addiction destigmatized, we need a language that's unified and we really need to take caution um, because of the heavy stigma around substance use disorders. And that's an excerpt from Recovery Research Institute. You may want to jot that it's recoveryresearchinstitute.org. If this is something really interesting to you that you want to be a trailblazer on, uh, that website is uh, fantastic for, they have um, something called the Addiction Area where Harvard University, a whole team who really care about this, came together to dissect every word that we use in this field and look for stigma alerts. And in addition to that, they have very current information for families, uh, loved ones and for for yourself. So just another uh, another possible resource for you if you're interested in that. So it's a question, do the current terms we, you use when talking about persons with substance use disorder or recovery empower, clarify, encourage, support, enlighten, unify, or do they innocently discourage, isolate, shame, embarrass those individuals? And so one way to think about that is 
to ask yourself, is this a term I would use for any other medical condition? So for example, um, the idea of a dirty urine, we wouldn't say to somebody that's diabetic that they had dirty glucose testing, right? So um, if the answer is no, we shouldn't use it. So that's one way to quickly check and see um, if we're in alignment with the, the medical aspect of substance use disorder. So uh, Dr. John Kelly says, if people with eating related conditions have always been referred to having an eating disorder, never as food abusers. And so why, why are uh, folks um, still being referred to as substance abusers and not having substance use disorder? So this is where I'm gonna need your helps. We're gonna play around a little bit with some language replacement and I would really love to hear your ideas, thought processes around this. I'm just gonna move your chat over a little. Um, so the potential, and again, I want to reiterate that I'm not saying that these always raise stigma, so I always like to put potential before it, but drug habit. So when we're using a term like they have a drug habit, it denies the medical nature of the condition and it implies the resolution of the problem is simply a matter of willpower and being able to stop the habitual behavior. So how do you feel about that? Do you believe that it's very simple for people to recover from substance use disorder through willpower? What are your thoughts on that? No. <laughs> Great one word answers. Absolutely. So here's just uh, some potential replacement terms is substance use dis disorder, which is what I've been using. Um, and then alcohol and drug disorder, disease of addiction. Um, these are some potential ways to talk about it versus drug habit. And as Gabe mentioned, habit doesn't seem to be a very accurate word. Um, and it, it it actually can take away uh, the seriousness of um, this whole issue. So now, that's right, Rebecca, it makes it seem like you can just stop whenever. And if that were the case, I think we might not be in the crisis that we are if it were that simple. Unfortunately, that's what people believe that have never been through this experience. Sorry, I'm having a little, there we go. So now I'm going to ask you, so here's a term prescription drug misuse. Which words in this term could create increased stigma and why? So what are your thoughts? Prescription drug misuse. Miss you. So Amanda, oh, and drug. I'd love to hear your thoughts of why, why would misuse and drug um, potentially create increased stigma? Any thoughts on that? Let's go with the uh, word up here we go, misuse. It makes it seem like they did it on purpose. Oftentimes it's not. That's a, and, uh, a lot of different prescriptions out there. Absolutely, right? So what prescription drugs are we talking about? Uh, misuse absolutely is very judgmental and Right, painkillers are often overprescribed, so uh, people may not even know the power of what they're taking. And all of a sudden, they find themselves um, becoming addicted to that. So, I am preaching to the choir. You guys are amazing. So, 
um, misuse is, like I just mentioned, an expression of judgment, um, and I love how you put it, Rebecca, they did it on purpose. Um, it's unclear and can be interpreted in many ways, and drug could also be misinterpreted, so you nailed it. So another hint for changing language is, does it have more than one interpretation? So just some thoughts. Um, a potential replacement term could be a non-medical use of a psychoactive substance. So it's it's talking about which prescriptions here, and it's just the non-medical use. Um, any thoughts on that replacement term? And again, these are just ideas and a way to think differently. So let's try this one, relapse. So relapse is a medical term, um, but in with substance use disorder, how does this word potentially increase stigma, and what does it imply? Weakness, Robert said, and um, I didn't see your your response, Amanda. But there may be a language barrier. Elderly individuals don't know all the um, medications they are taking, and actually, uh, latest statistics on that, Amanda, is um, it's 60, 65 percent of opioid uh, uh, use affecting people is in the senior population. I think you're absolutely right. That has a lot to do with it. Um, so. Relapse weakness. Um, they couldn't. They that they chose to. They weren't strong enough. And so, how can that harm individuals? The meaning of relapse is vague, right? Absolutely. It. I think it harms their self worth, right? So. Uh, it implies moral failure, increases shame. So if somebody has some other medical condition and things um, go back to an earlier place, no one is shaming them. In fact, usually people are surrounding these folks with love, right, and, and offering different methods that might work better, which is, I think, where the recovery movement is going, is we're offering so many different pathways now, because one might not work for an individual, so we want to continue to try different things, um, instead of um, increasing shame and uh, suggesting that people just aren't strong enough. So, Experiencing a recurrence of symptoms. So um, if we're looking at it through a disease model, these are symptoms and they're recurring. Um, they're out of partial remission. And the reason why I use partial remission is uh, if you're looking at uh, substance use disorder as a chronic disease, then there's not full remission. Um, partial remission means that um, they're uh, free of all the symptoms, so that's that's where that comes from. Any other ideas for a different way to talk about a relapse that would be kind and um, gentle and loving so that people are not so ashamed that they won't come back for help? Any ideas for other words? <laughs> I love it. They're working on their recovery. Awesome, Becca. What else? Any other? I had a setback. Things like that take away sort of the 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 bigness, the uh, blacker way of thinking of you were here and now you failed. And um, I personally in my life have seen many people not make it just because of the shame of a relapse. So learning about the triggers and identifying them. That's nice, Robert. Yes. Finding a different, you know, needing a different path of recovery or more than one. I need you all to be on this trailblazing bandwagon because you're 
thought processes are fantastic and it's people like you that can help make a huge difference in our world. So how about clean and sober? How does this phrase potentially increase stigma? What does it imply here and who does it eliminate? What are your thoughts around that? Robert, I've been running relapse prevention groups a large number of years with success. Boy, I would like to hear more about that because not everybody has had great success with that. So it eliminates those who are still working, yes. Let's take that word, let's take the words apart, clean and sober. What is that saying? Again, this is a, a, a very lovely phrase in within a 12-step um, program. That's right, it says people struggling are dirty. <laughs> um, using the word clean stigmatizes those who are still in recovery. It defines their inherent self-worth by their actions. So it raises the image of a dirty addict. Um, it implies that one was once dirty and unacceptable and, and actually being clean um, sounds like perfectionism. <laughs> um, and the word sober does not really employ the joy or happiness that one may experience in recovery. I certainly know many, many, many people over all these years that have beautiful, happy, joyous lives, the word sober would not be a way I would describe them. Um, and this language is specific to 12-step recovery and eliminates other pathways. Thank you for sharing all that, Robert, um, talking about your, your program that's been very successful about identifying warning signs, managing them, self-recovery, confidence, abilities and skills. That's beautiful. Thank you for doing that work. Replacement term is in recovery from substance use disorder, right? Or um, uh, free from chemical dependency. There's, there's, I love the word free from chemical dependency. Um, there's just something I, I was working with a group and a woman came up with this one and I kept it in my head because just the idea of freedom, that in itself says so much. And um, it just uh, it talks about then and now. Um, so, and again, these are just ideas. So I'm just trying to get your heads thinking about how these, how these things affect people. All right, this is an interesting one. So. I'm sure we've all heard medication-assisted treatment. Um, how could this phrase potentially harm the individual? And what's the stigma around the use of medication? I love your, that's great, Robert. Love it. Um, what do you think? Medication-assisted treatment. How could this phrase potentially harm the individual? And it's used all the time. Any ideas? I appreciate your honesty, Becca. Uh, not sure on that one, to be honest. It's one um, actually that I I put in this slide deck today um, after doing just a little bit more research uh, with John Kelly's work, and it really made a lot of sense. Uh, so the stigma surrounding the use of pharmacology, pharmacotherapy, in particular opioid against agonist therapy. So. Uh, Suboxone, etc., um, is arguably more potent and harmful than the general stigma about addiction. So this is Dr. Sarah Wakeman. She's the medical director at Mass General Hospital, and she works directly with uh, John Kelly. And so um, I don't know if you've had this experience where you all are, but even within recovery communities, there's stigma. So folks that are uh, going through abstinence-based recovery have uh, 
created some stigma around those that are using um, another form of treatment. So not only is the stigma sort of out here in the world, but it's even within the recovery community. So Robert, medication has been developed to assist people from suffering. This can be misused, abused, and found to be dependent upon. Yes, and 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 also for uh, a lot of folks, it's also been a, a ways that they can. Um, it, it can be used for harm reduction, and it can also be a, a pathway, and it also can be a way to get um, to abstinence. So. Uh, no matter what, people are going to maybe do, you know, down the road may um, <clears throat> not have non-medical use, um, but a lot of people have found this very effective. Um, so the thought process, why can't we call it treatment? Um, so why does it have to be labeled medication-assisted treatment? It, it's a form of treatment just like uh, going through a 12-step inpatient uh, residential program or going to uh, outpatient groups, um, but they might all be forms of treatment. So why do we have to put those th two words in front of it when it's just another form of treatment? So beyond, I want to see what you all have to say. I'm going too fast. I'm sorry. Um, so Amanda was saying that, that some programs believe you're in recovery because you're taking medication. Um, there will be different stigmas for different recoveries. Um, and then you know, um, I taught our Vermont Recovery Coach Academy for years. and usually around it's an intensive five-day program and a lot of people that had certain recovery paths really had a problem in this and um, one way to think about it is it's not my program and it's not my business <laughs> and whatever people need to do to not to to not have to live um, with substance use disorder and all the destruction that can happen um, uh, all of them should be open to people um, and that usually help people move from that place as it's holding multiple worldviews is personally you might not believe in something like that but as uh, someone who's supporting people having that worldview is um, every individual has the right um, to pick what is going to help them most um, and I know there's all kinds of thought processes around around that, but uh, again, any sort of stigma or somehow one is better than the other really can eliminate people from attending recovery groups. They feel unwelcomed, unwanted. So just something to think about there. Um, and you know, you guys are writing really good things. People pay a doctor and expect something when leaving the office. Prescriptions give the population that comfort that they got something for their time, effort, and money. And um, I mean, that could be a whole another webinar, Robert, about uh, the amount of prescriptions that are given here in the United States of America. Um, I'm going to stay here with this topic, but I hear you. I just wanted you to know that. So beyond the spoken word. We're talking about actually speaking, using this language, helping others think about language. Um, I just gave some ideas here about what, what, what language is being used on websites, um, brochures you may have, flyers, posters. Uh, what are people using for language if maybe they're on a panel or doing a public speaking event? or say your organization is doing a radio show or TV spot, are there other places beyond the spoken word that you might want to think about reviewing the language? Any thoughts on that? What did I leave out? <laughs> 
advocacy work. Absolutely. I'm going to add that to my list. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Advocacy work. So what are we, what are we saying when we're advocating for people or either, either that or self advocating? Any other thoughts on Oh, I like that, Becca. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? So um, it's okay if it's in line with the book more, but the way we talk in our clinics can stigmatize our peers. So could you give me an example of that? Because that's intriguing. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. You don't have to give me an example either. Um, really, even thinking about how do you refer to yourself? Um, um, oh, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, like in a supervision meeting with other providers when talking about the best way to treat the, the peer, the person, absolutely um, are you know, do we change the language behind the closed doors? Are we talking about people as people? Um, I love that, uh, to really maybe sit back at one of these um, meetings and really listening to how people are speaking and see, uh, are, are they all compassionate, inspiring, motivating ways to support another human being. Um, oh, so I need to come back to Idaho. So Idaho has an advocacy, core work and advocacy, stigma, community education. That is so great. What a great resource. Um, and Rebecca would love more information. So if you could type in chat how she could find that out, a website, that would be great. I kind of like to see it too. <laughs> I am always interested in what states are doing. That's beautiful. Students do panel discussions on stigma of student and community members. If we talk, type, and speak positive in everything we do, it will spread. I. Uh, what are your thoughts? This is upside track, but you guys are on fire. Uh, how about talking about the opioid crisis? Um, I was wondering if anybody would ever consider about talking about the uh, opioid recovery um, because we in uh, our nation, I might just be speaking for myself, tend to be very deficit based. And yes, I absolutely agree. It's 100% beyond crisis, it's an epidemic, but how can we even, get the word recovery out there um, as much as we're talking about crisis or epidemic. And uh, Robert, I love, I love this. Um, the community members, the students, panel discussions, really listening to each other. These listening circles are so helpful and I think have amazing impact. I'm so glad that you're doing that. So, Oops. So just another consideration is, oh, beautiful voice, discussion, prescription are beautiful. Uh, one way th is through social media. Yes, how can it be, you must be much younger than I am, Becca, because I always forget about social media, <laughs> but it's such a great place to start talking about recovery and using um, what I what I think of as uh, language to love people back to life because um, I think if anybody's been on this planet long enough, they've been through some really tough things, whether it's a substance use disorder or you know all the million different things that people go through is how can we love them back to life because sometimes people are just feeling low enough um, that they need others to love them back and how can we circle around them and do that. So, Pictures are powerful. Um, I had fun with this one because I have seen some pretty interesting brochures around substance use disorder. Um, um, 
sometimes they're targeting targeting uh, all the pictures are of one race um, or they're all youth um, they tend to try to uh, well as you can see um, the woman with her hoodie on is not looking happy at all all dressed in black um, treatment below like what does that image say to you what how do you feel about that one this is an image to inspire somebody to go to treatment any thoughts on that some other images um, often there's never images of uh, prominent people in the community, doctors, nurses, teachers, politicians, all, it's usually um, a pro <laughs> Oh, Robert, you just made me laugh. I'm a <laughs> I th <laughs> That's funny. I didn't even know what to say to that. Uh, I've been a biker in the past, too. Um, I think it's just this uh, I don't know, the images struck me in a way that it didn't really jive with the treatment and the angel with the stars. Um, yeah, I just um, sort of leaning toward folks that are look a certain way. Um, um, often it's youth. Um, It's real. Tell me more about what you're talking about, Robert. I want to hear more about that because we have some time. It is real. I mean, um, you know, I spent some time in Montana and um, recently, and you know, their their primary uh, uh, drug problem is uh, methamphetamines versus uh, heroin. So. The, they're really uh, struggling even more so with that. And absolutely, uh, uh, people are going to look a different way that, you know, as we all know, that drug can really change even the structure of your face, teeth. Um, uh, it is real, but does it depict just like you said, the biker person, or uh, what about having imagery of all different ages, uh, races, male, female, um, that when you're, when you're using images to, to depict that this can happen to anyone. Um, Rebecca, Rebecca, yes, it recovery has many faces. Um, and Robert, tell me a little bit more about women have a stigma that men do not have. I, I would love to hear, especially coming from you, I'd like to hear what your thought is on that. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> Where do you suppose that comes from? This, this stigma that men don't have. So Rebecca wants to know too, Robert, just to compare, is this just what you've seen then, Robert? And it's a bar flies, low class, mothers, lower class, don't deserve treatment. Very interesting. I'm really glad that you're doing the work that you do. Um, yes, uh, I think being culturally sensitive um, on to how stigma affects uh, different ethnic groups, um, different genders, uh, is it tells me that you are culturally sensitive to more than just sort of across the board, and I appreciate that. Um, so thank you for sharing that. 
So my, we're coming to an end and uh, I can't thank you enough. I, I wish I was actually in person with you because I think we could just keep going and have a fantastic conversation. Um, and just the work that you're doing, whether it's 26 years or just starting out uh, means that your people uh, in Idaho that are making a difference and uh, helping to save lives and your thought process really demonstrates that you're really thinking about people as people and um, that that warms my heart. I just want to tell you I honor the work that you're doing because sometimes uh, people don't necessarily thank you uh, because they're in sort of just a place where that might not be at the forefront, but I thank you. So what's what's one immediate action step you or your organization could take in this national movement to change the language in our field? And again, things I suggested today are just suggestions or things to think about, um, certainly not the words that everybody should use by any means, but anything that moved you enough that you'd like to take either an internal or external action or step? Any, I hate to use the word aha moments, but I can never think of another way to say it. Anything that you're like, wow, I haven't thought about that before. Oh, Robert, that's nice. Bringing, bringing some ideas to the table. I like that. And then uh, Rebecca at my clinic does monthly CU community classes. I'm going to ask about having one about changing the language and recovery. So one thing for you guys, if you want to um, go on the recovery research institute.org, uh, you can click on the dictionary and also read some articles on the work that they've done and some um, tests they've done on on people actually providing treatment services using one kind of language and another, and then the completely different attitude and response they had, which um, I think is pretty fascinating research. So if you wanted to bring forth some uh, uh, researched, heavily researched and thought through uh, recovery language pieces, that would be a, a great area to start. So I encourage you to take a look on it. Um, Oh, Amanda, I love that you're on a new journey, so you'll be spreading everything learn and know throughout the state. That's a trailblazer right there, and um, I love that. It makes me smile. Well, I is there any other, um, oh, recoveryresearchinstitute.org. Uh, let me ask Gabe. Gabe, do you have um, everyone's email that I could send you this and you could disseminate? That's really weird. Yes, I do. Yeah, I can send that to everyone. Okay, so I will send you the I'll send Gabe the link so that you can all have that if you're having a hard time pulling up the website. So are any any final thoughts as we come into a close? I love that. Focus on recovery and resiliency instead of illness or crisis. Pay more attention to what's working in our system instead of the challenges, barriers. Focusing on strengths instead of weaknesses. Um, that's beautifully said. I think uh, building resiliency in people from an early age uh, might be an antidote to this toxic stress that people are feeling. And I, again, want to say thank you so much for taking some time out of your day. Um, I hope that uh, there was something that you got out of this, and I will be sure to send that uh, link for you so you can explore that website. And um, keep doing the great work that you're doing, and have a beautiful day. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Gabe.